So again, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Priya Rao, I'm the executive editor at Glossy, and this is a live Zoom version of the Glossy Beauty Podcast with Greg Redfrew, the CEO and founder of Beauty Counter. Hi, Greg, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Good, um, Greg, so I know we've been talking a little bit since, um, you know, since, our, since the new normal kind of hit a couple of weeks ago, uh, but tell me a little bit about what's going on for you. Like, obviously, how are you doing? Where are you? What's life at home like? Life and work at home. Life at work at home. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, first and foremost, um, I want to say for anyone that's listening, I hope you are able to be home and safe. I feel very fortunate to be in a position where I am inside the safety and comfort of a home and not out on the front lines. And I have enormous respect for everyone that is serving all of us on the front lines right now. Uh, I am in Los Angeles, actually technically in Malibu right now in a home. And you know, feel, feel fortunate to be in California. At least we have, you know, warm weather and a lot of sunshine, but it's still, you know, it's, it's a crazy moment in time for all of us dealing with so much uncertainty, trying to balance, you know, work life, family life, all in one physical place without leaving. So it's been, it's been quite an experience. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, Greg, tell me a little bit about when you started to notice kind of a change in, in the ether and, and, and what the real ramifications of COVID-19 was here in the States. I think for me, we were in mid to late February, uh, we had our annual conference, which was planned to be in um, San Francisco the week of March 4th. And it was, we were bringing about 2000 people in our community, our, our part of our advocates, uh, our independent consultants were coming in and we, two weeks prior, so I guess around mid February, we started to take a look at, at what was happening you know, not just in China, but also starting to hear rumblings in the U.S. that this is coming. And as a company that has been focused on the health of safety and safety of our community and the community at large from day one, we started to make some pretty significant changes, inclusive of uh, canceling our annual conference and, and pivoting and doing it, you know, via, uh, via streaming in, out of Hollywood um, during the time it was supposed to be in San Francisco. And that was a pretty bold move because it was before anyone was really talking about it in a, in a really significant way, uh, but I think it afforded us the opportunity to move quickly knowing it was coming. Yeah, and Greg, you have about 50,000 independent consultants. So how many usually go to this conference or is, is it all 50,000? And with, how are you able to like dis, um, disseminate that same information in a much more fragmented um, process? So we have done all different types of annual conferences. We used to have many thousands of people come and in the last two years, we decided to, to do it into, for a smaller group. So it's something that they have to earn sort of the right to, that doesn't sound right, but you know, they had to be at a certain level in the organization to be able to participate and we call it lead and it's supposed to be specifically for leadership training. So we had 2000 women who were attending, who were planning to attend in San Francisco. And when we decided to pivot, we made it available to all of our 50,000 consultants and they had home view viewing parties not only over all over the US and Canada, but actually all over the world. And so I think we reached many, many tens of thousands of people because they also invited friends and family members in to watch, to hear us speak about our business and our, our, you know, our mission and our products. So it was actually very successful for us doing it via live stream. Yeah. What about, um, you know, I think for people who may not understand totally Beauty Counter's model and like that it is a social selling platform, you know, obviously you have front stores here in New York and in other places, but how digitally ramped up would you say these parties were or these social selling events for representatives to sell to their, you know, friends and family or their extended network before all this? It's been really interesting. So Beauty Counter from day one has been a direct to consumer brand that is powered by people. We are multifaceted and multi-channeled. We make our products available to our clients through a network of independent consultants, now 50,000 strong in the US and Canada through our wholly owned retail locations in New York and Denver, soon to be Los Angeles, our pop-ups that we've done in Nantucket and the Hamptons. And then we also have retail partnerships in beautycounter.com. And I think for our independent consultants, many of them are, well, they're all digitally, well, that's not a fair statement. Many of them are digitally native. Uh, some have become digitally you know, proficient, uh, but they really are utilizing, they have the sort of original work from home model and it has been very digitally focused since day one. So they're utilizing their social channels, they're us utilizing um, you know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, they utilize Zoom and Voxer and Skype, and they have forever done that. And so 
they were so well positioned to take advantage of a moment in time where they were at home and been able to continue to build their businesses because it wasn't, I mean, obviously it was an interruption in life and a scary moment in time, but from a business perspective, it has not been a huge interruption. They were already very well versed on how to build businesses digitally. Do you think that they all, I mean, I guess I'm wondering from like your internal, your team on the corporate side, and then also within your consultants, what were the murmurs and conversations going on within, you know, that community? Because, you know, obviously we were seeing, all seeing what was happening in the news. I think what was going on in New York was very different than what was happening in California. And even, you know, still what's going on in the South versus what's going on in Texas. So I think, um, what is, what was the community like feedback loop like? I think from the beginning, first and foremost, they were incredibly appreciative of the fact that we decided to cancel our conference and put their health and safety first. That's It's on par with everything we've done as a brand and a business from day one for the past seven years. I think that they have felt that it was a moment in time where they had economic stability and economic opportunity for which they are extremely thankful at a time where so many people are being furloughed or being made redundant, you know, spouses, partners, girlfriends, boyfriends, and family members losing jobs. It was an opportunity to be able to serve their community and their clients through, you know, our high performing and safe products. I think that was really um, important for all of them and, and, and to be able to utilize this consultant community as, you know, emotional support, you know, business support, you know, whatever it is through friendship, I think that's been incredibly important to them in this time. And so we've been having very direct conversations with them back and forth about how we've been able to pivot the business, what is helpful to them at this moment in time, how do we create operational stability and excellence for them so that they can continue to earn an income, which now more than ever is much needed. And I think that it's just been a very robust, um, rich dialogue. And we've been able to pivot as they've informed us of what their needs are in this moment in time. Will you talk a little bit about that, um, Greg? Just the idea of, you know, people who maybe have been using Beauty Counter as a side hustle or, you know, something to do on the side when it's now becoming their main hustle, you know, when unemployment is through the roof, when they've been furloughed or laid off from beauty jobs or non-beauty jobs, um, what that was like and what kind of impact that had for you and holding all those kind of positions in, in your four walls and in your hands in a way. Yeah, you know, it's been an incredibly stressful moment for me as a founder and CEO because I feel an enormous sense of responsibility to make sure that we are operationally sound for these 50,000 families who, again, may never have relied on us for financial independence, but actually enjoy being part of the movement, we enjoy being advocates, educators, wanting to help us be part of meaningful change. And now all of a sudden they're finding themselves relying on this income that used to be a side gig or just a they used to be a dabbler, they used to do it for fun, or even many of our clients or, or you know, people who just loved the product are now turning this for a business opportunity um, to enjoy the savings and to be able to earn an income. And I think that's been, it's been, you know, it's, you know, I say it's both our opportunity and our responsibility right now to share this business opportunity with people, because it may just be a three month short term gig for them that helps them in a moment of time. But, but the fact that we're able to help these people put, um, you know, I don't want to be extreme by saying put food on the table, but I think it's more to be able to continue to pay their mortgages, their rent, when other things have dried up. And I've seen a lot of people who work in service industries who are estheticians, makeup artists, um, uh, personal trainers, fitness instructors, chiropractors, all those types of jobs, retail executives in fashion, beauty, and everything, all turning to us to say, hey, how can I jump on beautycounter.com, sign up as a consultant? And you know, we've made that accessible to people by creating free enrollment for this period of time. It's something that we don't do, but we want to help people right now. And, you know, I feel like we're the helpers we're here to serve. And, you know, it's been a challenging moment in time, but I think that many of them have been able to, to replace some income, whether that's $50 or whether that's $500 or 5,000 people are working towards replacing income that's not, that's not happening for them otherwise right now. Do you think the um, demographic or, you know, psychographic profile of who an uh, independent seller was for Beauty Counter has changed in this climate? Like, you know, are you seeing, I mean, obviously you're a clean beauty brand, you have really high standards in terms of e efficacy as well as clean ingredients, but, you know, maybe this has made, you know, people that you wouldn't have expected in the past to join, join now. Yes, and you know, again, I said earlier, so many of our clients and all their people who would hardly heard of the brand have been reaching out uh, to ask us, you know, is this possible for me to earn an income on your platform and how would I go about doing this? And I've been showing, you know, trying to show people if you, if you spend the hundred dollars on the starter kit or for, for some, they, they can afford the more 
um, you know, more comprehensive kits, which are in the range of prices, we're trying to show them how to immediately replace their income. And I do think people are really leaning into this business opportunity because they're unable to leave their homes and they're, and they're looking to replace income or, or, you know, I'll tell you what we've seen when you ask about shift in demographics. I mean, we've seen an enormous number of younger people, college age students who are, I would say, you know, you're, you're, you're out, it's like senior spring in college. You're like hanging with your boyfriend, you're going to parties, like having a blast and all of a sudden they're like, just kidding. You're at home with your parents, stuck inside, can't, <laughs> see anymore, can't see your friends anymore, can't kiss your boyfriend anymore you're stuck at home and so we've found that there's been a huge surge of younger people joining us you know starting as early as 18 and all through the early 20s who are just looking to get out of their home even if they're physically in their home right right um what about you know i think there's been an interesting conversation happening in beauty is like what is beauty today right like are people spending on lipstick or skincare or is it really all about self-care treatments or personal care what have you found in terms of what your sellers want to sell and what people are buying yes it's interesting so i think people are really making um they're prioritizing their spend. I think that everyone is spending a little bit less right now in anticipation of a, of a pretty significant recession. They are spending and the areas in which they are spending are, they are spending on lip because it's a, it's a little luxury. You can get a lipstick or a lip gloss, especially when you're on Zoom and you're trying to look somewhat cute, uh, which is harder for me every day, but at least you can put on the lip, you can put on a brow, you can put on your tinted moisturizer. So those are, from a cosmetic standpoint, the things that we see holding firm. I think that where people are investing is in cleansers, lotions, you know, hand soaps, bars of soap, and of course in their skincare regimens, because I think it is allowing people a sense of normalcy and everyone's still getting up and taking a shower and washing their hair and taking care of their skin. And so I think they're focusing on those, anything that makes them feel better or they feel is more wellness oriented versus maybe a nice to have. Those are those nice to haves are things that we don't see people purchasing a lot. Right, right. Do you feel like the conversation and the way that you've talked about products is definitely changed? Because, you know, I think there's something, you know, I hear a lot covering beauty and you must hear a lot with other beauty founders and CEOs is like, how do you talk about beauty in this moment? What's been your approach? I think for first and foremost, you know, because of the fact that we have a network of independent consultants, I've been talking a lot about the business opportunity. And when people ask me, why are you talking about it in this moment of time? I feel like we are here to serve our clients and our community by being a dependable resource for product and for business opportunities. I think that, you know, my, my feeling is that we recognize what, what we recognize the struggles of our clients, because we are those people. We're all going through this together. And so I've encouraged everyone in the beauty counter community from the corporate team to our independent consultants to, to very, you know, to be really on a listening tour, to listen to what are, what are your clients talking about right now? What do they need? How can you best serve them in this moment of time? How can you help them prioritize a spend, their spend? How can you help lend a business opportunity to them should they need it and do it with compassion, empathy, emotional intelligence, recognizing that there's so much uncertainty out there, but helping them do this. I also think that as women, we shouldn't feel ashamed for wanting to take care of ourselves during this moment in time. And I think part of your emotional and physical well-being is how you're taking care of your body. Are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? Are you still putting on your tinted moisturizer with sunscreen or your sunscreen when you're going outside? Even though we're in the middle of a pandemic, which is extremely sad and scary, we still need to take care of our bodies. And all of those things do contribute to your overall wellness, as do, you know, as do, uh, as does keeping um, consistent with your normal routines in life. And so I've been encouraging people to, to listen more than they talk, to make sure that they are there to serve, not to sell, that we lend a hand through extending our business opportunity and, and letting people explore themselves on beautycounter.com. And then, you know, like today we launched a vitamin C serum, which we've already seen our clients just go crazy because maybe that's just a little bit of sunshine in a moment where there's so much darkness. They can say, wow, I, I have a serum that we've been looking forward to and I'm going to splurge on that one item. And so, so that's what we're really talking about and seeing and thinking about right now. It's just being, it's, it's don't, you know, I think there are some brands that are a little bit tone deaf and I'm always encouraging people to think about how would you feel in this moment if someone were speaking to you about product or the business opportunity and that's how I try to, I try to treat my clients as I would like to be treated right now. How do you 
decide whether or not to go ahead with a launch right now or not? Like you mentioned, you're launching that vitamin C serum right now and why that was an important thing for you to do as a brand and as a, as a company, but, you know, couching it under these conditions, like how do you, how do you decide and make those decisions? We've certainly pushed back some of our launches. This vitamin C or some serum has been much anticipated. We'd already gotten the product out into our um, community, you know, months prior and had seen incredible response to it. So we didn't want to let down our consultants and our clients when we told them it was coming. So again, I am focused as a company on really trying to be as reliable, trustworthy, dependable as we can be, which, which includes giving them what we said we're going to do and holding, upholding our promises to the best of our abilities. Now, we have decided to push a few things back a little bit uh, to be sensitive to what's going on out there. But, you know, I think having something that makes people feel, feel really good, that's, that's the perfect partner to our overnight resurfacing feel, which is a top seller for us, even in this moment in time, we decided to go ahead and do that. But we are looking very closely at, you know, how do we have in stock all the products that people depend on us, those consumable products that they need from us, every single day and then what things do we want to launch and which things do we want to reserve the right to launch next year when things have settled down a little bit. Right, right. Um, and Greg, I know that, you know, you mentioned the word a second ago, social listening tour, and that, you know, you kind of are asking your corporate team as well as your sellers and independent consultants to do this, but you yourself are going on this tour yourself. And really, I, is it right that you've spoken to 7,000 of your consultants already and you're doing this daily? Will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I don't know the exact number, but yes, many, many thousands, certainly north, <laughs> north of five and less than 10,000 directly right now. You know, I feel like, um, you know, it's interesting. I feel now more than ever that, I think, you know, we get caught up as founders and CEOs. Um, you get so busy doing your job, you're not doing your job. And I don't care what business you're in. And I don't care what moment in time it is. You're in the only one business and that is in the business of people and serving your people. I believe strongly in servant leadership. I feel strongly in, uh, in being as invested in the success of my team as I am in my own personal success. And so I have felt more than ever that they have needed me to lean in, to give them the confidence to go forward, to help them stay the course, to have open, honest conversations about what's working and what's not working, what they're scared about, what they're sad about. You know, we have a number of our community members who are serving on the front lines and I wanna pay respect to them and I wanna hear how it's going. And I think with every difficult moment in time, there's always opportunity. And for me, the opportunity has been to not just to our consultant community, but our, our client community at large, you know, because we are a direct to consumer brand. and we place a lot of emphasis on our independent consultants, but we also have you know, a million people around us buying products from us that we need to serve as well. And so trying to have a two-way dialogue to hear what people need, how they would like me to serve them in this moment, how can I best support their efforts as a client, as a consultant, I think it's been a really important part of it. I've learned so much about what's going on with Americans today and Canadians today, um, but also what they need from me and how I, I mean, it allows me the ability to, to pivot really quickly when I realize that what I'm doing isn't necessarily serving their needs in that moment in time. How does that compare to, because I know you, I know Greg, and we've talked about this, um, that you've also had a lot of conversations, direct conversations with other set founders and CEOs, and you've been in those kind of groups with them as well. How does that necessarily compare to what you're hearing from your clients, from your, from your team, and then what hearing other businesses are experiencing or feeling? Well, I think, you know, Beauty Counter is, uh, unlike many companies, I think we are, we are, thankfully in a good position where we're profitable we have cash on reserve we do not rely on wholesale which is really challenging right now you know people will say well my e-commerce sales are up but my retail sales are obviously non-existent and so i do feel incredibly fortunate right now and respectful of all of my counterparts for whom this moment is even more challenging given that their entire business was through wholesale distribution. And even if they've been able to move it online, your clients don't move as quickly online as they do. You know, people don't change behaviors overnight. So yes, you're seeing a trend of, you know, upward, you know, upward mobility or revenue or however you want to look at it in, in e-commerce for many companies, but it still doesn't even come close to making up for um, what's going on out there. I will say that all of us are talking about the fact that the future of commerce and specific to beauty is going to continue to be direct to consumer. I think the wholesalers in general are in a lot of trouble right now. I hope some of them weather the storm. I think some of them will not, unfortunately. And so being able to have a direct dialogue with your client and for us, our two clients, our clients and our independent consultants is critical today and will be I think in the, in the future months and years, I don't think this pandemic is going to be 
over when we open our doors again on July 1st or June 1st. I think this is going to be an ongoing thing over the next 12 to 24 months. And, and with that will come a recession and a lot of fear. And so if you're not talking directly to those that you serve, I think I would encourage them to do that. And that's something we've been talking about quite a bit on this call. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody who's listening in um, to please share questions. We're going to have about 10 minutes of questions at the end of this conversation with Greg. Um, so please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Um, that'll be in about eight minutes. So uh, just get your questions ready. Uh, but Greg, you mentioned a second ago you about consumer behavior, and that is going to change. Yeah. And the way that people buy, the way people research, review, all of the above. Um, what other things are you thinking about in the long term that we can predict about consumer behavior? What do you think they're gonna be more comfortable with, your customers and the customer set at large? Um, well, I certainly don't have a crystal ball. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> one woman and one brand. I do think that the future of retail, one of the things I've been hearing on this call and I think is interesting is that retail is slow, but conversion is higher. So less people are going into stores, but when they are, they're converting at the higher pace. I do think that people are gonna be this, this, whatever the new normal is or the old, the way in which we lived before will not be the same for a very long time. So I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis placed on digital tools, on, you know, um, on uh, sampling, but not necessarily in stores where you're touching and feeling everything. People are relying increasingly on uh, micro influencers and social networks. And so I think that we're going to see a lot of this uh, build coming from direct relationships between, I think the consumers have over the last, let's just say decade or so, really increasingly been demanding of their brands, authenticity, sustainability, transparency, um, a voice in, in product development of wanting to be part of the equation. And I think now more than ever, we're going to see that continue to rise. People are going to be increasingly focused on wellness, on clean beauty, but holistically on everything from meditation to sexual health to sleep. It's not just about beauty, it's that it's a holistic approach to beauty. And they're gonna to wanna to be having back and forth conversations with the brands that they support and trust and expecting them to listen now more than ever and to interact with them in new and innovative ways. I do think that will be true. Greg, what do you think about the brands right now? I think it's been interesting because they're, you know, this year kind of kicked off you know, before all of this in the US, the conversations around inclusivity, sustainability, clean were like fever pitch. And everybody was saying them, like people you wouldn't even expect to say them. We're, we're talking about these themes, we're talking about them. Now we're seeing a lot of that fall by the wayside. Do you think the customer is noticing that? Like, do you think that those brands are gonna be able to, um, you know, buy or, or reliably talk about sustainability or inclusivity or, um, clean when they're not doing it all the time. I think that, again, I think that authenticity is critically important. So if you're not doing it, you shouldn't be talking about it. You should be talking about what you are able to do and not project what you would like to be doing. I think that there's a, there's a, there's a no bullshit filter that people, you know, they have, they have less patience right now. If you're saying, oh, we're the most sustainable brand, they're like, hold on, no, you're not. I do think from a, with respect specifically to sustainability, I do think that the entire world has re re realized that we do have a significant impact on the earth each and every day. And we're seeing that with dolphins swimming in the Venice canals in Los Angeles for the first time in 40 years, the air quality over China is significantly improved. The water is cleaner and you know, the carbon emissions are down. I mean, we all know that we have an impact on mother earth and it's almost like mother earth is saying, I just have had a moment to breathe. And so I do think you're gonna see an increased focus on sustainability because I think people are realizing, wow, like I, even in our own corporate team, as an example, having been forced to work from home, they thought they've all started to say, wow, what is, what is my carbon footprint? What if I were working from home less often? I think a lot of companies you're gonna see are gonna do more work from home models, maybe not full-time, but maybe there's a part-time um, opportunity. So I think you're gonna see that. I think in terms of, of clean and inclusivity, I think clean was already here to stay. We pioneered at Beauty Counter and led the clean beauty movement. And I know when I started the company, people told me no one would ever care about clean ingredients. Then, then it was sort of like, oh, are you all a fad? And then, oh, it's, it's trending now. I, I think now more than ever, Clean beauty is incredibly important in the minds of consumers because they are trying to take care of themselves. And I think inclusivity, I hope that this moment in time has allowed us all to realize that we are one community, that we all are people going through the same things every single day. And I hope that people continue to focus on the fact that everyone needs to meet everyone um, and that we can't sort of just 
certain segments of the population, but everyone needs to be included in all of our efforts. I think, I hope that if there's one positive thing that has come out of this nightmarish, you know, environment in which we're living is that we, that we're looking to community, we're looking to others and we're realizing it that while we may on the surface appear, appear different, we are very much the same. Yeah. As Greg, what about, um, when you think about like how you're managing like both the triage piece of this and then the long-term strategy piece of this within your own four walls and within your, your two hands, I see your, someone pulling up in your driveway. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what do you think? I don't know where he's going. <laughs> Maybe he's going to go for a drive because he wants to get away from me. I don't know. I wouldn't um, like <laughs> I mean, I think we're all there at this point, so no problem. But when you think about, you know, like the tactical piece of managing the day-to-day -day and then also thinking about long-term strategy, how are you able to hold those two things in your hands right now? So, I, you know, look, I think as, as a founder and as a CEO of a company, I, for the past six weeks, I think it is safe to say I have been focused on the here and now. How do we shore up the business? How do we create supply chain redundancy? How do we ensure that our clients and consultants can continue to to be feel supported by us and how do we become that reliable trustworthy source that people need at a moment in time as a ceo i'm equally now focused on okay we've shored up the business we've made sure that we have enough supply of you know products that we've worked so closely with our contract manufacturing partners and everyone up and down the supply chain to make sure that they are safe, that they're upholding safety standards, that they're able to, that we're as supportive of them as they are of us. And now my focus is on, okay, in, in, as, a, as a leader brand, how do we continue to innovate? Where are the opportunities to build? Where are the opportunities to serve? How do we allocate our money? What is the world going to look like in three, six, nine, 12, 18, 24 months? I can't just be looking at this moment of time because this is a moment of time in time. And this too will pass. I don't think it's going to pass as quickly as we would all like. And I think that there will be many people lost along the way and many businesses lost along the way. And that is super scary and sad. And so I'm trying to say, okay, we've done what we can to short today. Now, how do we look to tomorrow to be those that leader to help serve communities, help build our businesses? And how do we drive innovation that will be meaningful to consumers, not just in the near term, but in the long term? Perfect. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, this is a great conversation. I obviously want to open it up for questions. Um, the first one we have um, is from an anonymous attendee, but um, they said, Greg, as you think about providing customers with a sense of normalcy and continuity to maintain their beauty routine um, and their beauty regimen, what role do models like subscription and auto replenishment play in D to C? You know, it's interesting because I was just on a call earlier when they were talking about the fact that people are you know, thinking more about subscription-based businesses in the absence of wholesale distribution. You know, we've never been a D2C subscription-based business. I've always felt that, you know, you should be able to have the flexibility of buying what you want, when you want, how you want as a consumer of our brand. But I do think that they may, we may see an emergence of more subscription-based businesses to serve the needs of the consumer, given that wholesale distribution is going to be very challenged in the, in the short and probably long term. I have a follow-up for you, Greg, with that. You know, yeah. it, for a brand like yours, which is so much about newness and discovery and, and beauty is like that, how do you how do you think that plays with the beauty category? In terms of subscription? Yeah, because isn't that kind of just like auto, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the idea of auto replenishment has often been that you lock in the customer, right? <laughs> Yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not, that's just sort of not my MO. I feel like if it serves the client's needs and they would like to be on a subscription-based business, then that's fine. I think that um, for us, it's always been about, you know, the, the, the tried and true staples of all of our, of all of our beauty, you know, regimes has always been, you know, our skincare regimens and, and our, you know, sort of, we always call it our flawless in five, five minutes. I'm like, what are those five things you're going to put on in five minutes to get out the door? And then there's all the add-ons. For us, I think the newness always comes from those add-ons. Like, what's that new sexy object that gets us all excited? Right now, I'm just trying to focus on stability for our clients because I think that's what people need now more than ever. And so for us, you know, is there an opportunity to do a subscription-based model? Maybe in the future, but right now, we're just trying to focus on stability for our clients. Um, and newness will... I think there probably, we may find that there's less newness, but the newness that comes will count. Does that make sense? Like it may not be, it may, it's more about um, quality versus quantity. Yeah, yeah. This question is for Matt. How have you had any challenge, 
Have you had any challenges manager, managing your inventory and distribution during this period? And do you anticipate having seasonal inventory challenges with surplus or shortage as we come out of quarantine? I think that's something the fashion business is really experiencing yeah, right now. It's a big thing. So the answer is yes, of course, not of course. Yes, we've had some challenges with inventory. Again, we were fortunate in that we saw this coming a little bit sooner than others because of our annual conference. We just, we were able to start shoring up our inventory supply earlier than some. Um, will we be over um, overstocked on certain items? I mean, maybe on sunscreen if we're not let outside of our house, although I think the blue light protection is, is helping sell sunscreen right now. People are still wearing sunscreen. But I do think we are very carefully managing our supply chain, working very closely with our contract manufacturers and raw material suppliers. Again, I think one of the things that's an opportunity in this moment in time, and if, if, if you are an operator, which is perhaps why you asked the question, I would be creating a open you know chat group with other people who are your peers we've found that we've been able to help one another and asking our supply chain partners to help one another so if someone's out of a material a specific ingredients can you move it from one center to the other and be and be allies and friends with one another and help each other during difficult times as opposed to always looking at people as your competitors and i think we've been really encouraging that open conversation and it has allowed us to stay stable operationally during this moment in time this is a little bit um, less operational, but maybe it would be. Uh, this is from Stacy. What is your biggest frustration right now? <laughs> Where do I begin? My biggest frustration right now is, um, well, I think one, one of my frustrations is, is um, trying to get it. Well, I think, oh God, there's so many. How I look on Zoom, <laughs> for one thing, I hate the way how to look at myself on this camera all day long. Um, I wish it happened when I was like 25 years younger. I think that, um, I think I'm frustrated with, uh, you know, trying to work at, at home, manage my kids, homeschool, and do this all. I do feel like everything's sort of bleeding together into one thing, so I find that to be challenging. I'm trying to keep ourselves on the schedule and trying to get my um, kids to help me out with the with the housework. My frustration is my walk upstairs and their clothes all over the floor, and I think <laughs> put it in a hamper. Um, and I do sometimes think with our independent consultants that they lack the confidence to talk and extend this business opportunity to people. And I keep saying right now that I feel like it's both an opportunity for our company, but most importantly, it's a responsibility because so many people are, are hurting financially and need that side gig and we have and I just want them to have the confidence it's probably a consistent frustration of mine which is women don't have enough confidence in themselves and I try so hard to help people overcome that and to let them know they've got everything that they need to be successful today and every single day and that's just something we as women in general tend to lack. Yeah um, this is a two-part question from another anonymous attendee um, about the topic of trends and predictions. Um, you talked about meditation and sexual wellness products. Will Beauty Counter be offering or creating products in these categories? And two, um, in terms of the rise in working from home, will Beauty Counter corporate office be pivoting towards more of a working from home model after social distancing and shelter in place ends? I wonder if this is one of my, one of our associates. Um, so <laughs> we, are not, we are not currently planning on creating um, sexual, um, uh, wellness products, you know, I think there are some companies that are doing a great job with it right now. And I think it's not our, you know, primary area of focus. Certainly it's not in, in our current pipeline of products. Um, meditation is something that we've started to do on a corporate level. I think there's some great, obviously some great apps out there. We've been using Unplug uh, Meditation based out of Los Angeles, but one of our digital product leads actually um, teaches meditation. So we do it in our offices and have for quite some time. I do believe in that deep breathing, you know, the Three, three breaths in and six breaths out. I, I do that all the time. Um, I do think it really helps. So if you don't do that, three in, six out, at least it's a beginning of a practice. Um, I do think that I, as the founder and CEO of my company, I'm looking to more flexibility. And we are talking about, is it one day a week or one every other week where we actually allow our associates in the corporate offices to work from home? We haven't nailed it down, but I'm looking at it very carefully. I honestly have enjoyed having a little bit of that balance. I, as a person, have had to travel incessantly for my career over the last seven years, and I do have three children, and I know it's been challenging for them and for me. And so I think I'm trying to find help people find that work-life balance and they come out of the other end of this pandemic. Um, and then we have about one more, uh, time for one more question. Um, and it's going to be Shauna, uh, Shauna McMahon. What's the first thing you want to do when this pandemic is over? Uh, maybe some inspirational ideas for our listeners out there. Do you have any thoughts, Greg? 
beauty related or others. That could be inspirational. I'm gonna get my hair blown dry properly. Like my hair is like, such bad hair. And like, I try to like blow it dry, but it just looks like a mess constantly. Yeah. So that's probably one thing that I'm gonna be doing that and getting, you know, getting a manicure. Um, but I honestly think if I, if, you know, when things lift, I think that I, I want to get in my car. I said to my husband, I was like, maybe we should drive across the country and go out and see people and see the, the beauty of uh, the sort of natural beauty of the United States. Like I've never done it before that drive across the country, but I've, I've thought about that as something that maybe we do in the, in the summer months. I don't think there's going to be a ton of air travel happening. I could be wrong. And so I'm trying to think what I can do more locally, how I can support my consultants, help them build their businesses, go see them. Um, I've met so many people through Zoom over the last couple of months and I now want to meet some of them in the physical world. So I think those are some of the things I'll be doing when I get out. But first, a good blow dry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. It was great having you. I know we have a lot more questions out there, but this is what we could get to today. And we'll obviously be airing this on Thursday, uh, this live version with Greg. So thank you again, Greg. Stay safe and healthy. Well, thank you so much for having me. And thanks for everyone being such great supporters of Beauty Counter. We really appreciate all of it. So thanks so much. Have an awesome day. You too. Bye-bye.